and we'd love to hear a little bit about what you're doing in your office and what you think about uh, the status of some of the big transit projects that are ongoing right now. Great, thank you, uh, thank you, Brian, and uh, to everyone on uh, online this afternoon. Thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to provide you a bit of an insight on um, what the role of the transit expansion office is at the City of Toronto, um, and what my role is and, and my division's role. So uh, maybe what I'll do is, uh, as Brian suggested, is to just give you a, a quick update as to kind of or a bit uh, of an explanation of who we are. Um, so I'm not sure if you are aware, but we are a, a division of the city of Toronto. So we are part of the, the city's division, um, city's division structure. Uh, we work for um, what they call the infrastructure uh, development section um, division of the, of the city of Toronto. So IDS. Um, and that's, that's where we sit in the, um, in this, in the city's um, structure. So I report through to Tracy Cook, who ultimately reports through to the city manager. So that's kind of just generally the, the, the structure that exists. So our uh, main function is to coordinate the city's participation in the multi-billion dollar higher order transit um, uh, programs that are, that are currently underway. So um, we are engaged closely with the TTC on uh, many of their projects. Uh, and how they connect into these higher order forms of transit. But there is a separation in terms of surface transit versus, um, to simplify it, the, the subway uh, type of transit uh, program. So kind of below grade, say versus above grade, but no, that's oversimplifying it. So we were created in uh, two, 2019. And as Brian has said, uh, I came on around the time that uh, the province chose to upload uh, the subway programs to um, to the province, so to Metrolinx in, in particular. Um, so that occurred roughly in June of 2019. Uh, and we've been uh, effectively working with the province uh, on behalf of the city. Uh, so our role is to is to advocate for the city, um, to, you know, with Metrolinx and with Infrastructure Ontario on the projects um, that they've uh, now taken on. So it's not just the uh, subway program, which is huge in and of itself, but it's also the GO expansion and it's also rapid transit, uh, as well as smart track, uh, as well as uh, transit oriented communities, um, which are all various uh, buckets of work within uh, my transit expansion division that, I'm, that, that we're looking after. So Effectively, just to give you kind of a high level, so we're responsible both for the, um, the strategic uh, coordination of, of the work that's going on, as well as the implementation side. So we are um, involved in the project from its inception um, through, to its, through to its closeout. So every stage in between, we're involved in it. Now, um, whereas before we would have probably been extremely more active in certain aspects of it. Um, we are at this point in time, you know, in the role of coordinating, monitoring and making sure quite honestly that the, the needs of the city are addressed in the um, bidding documents that go out uh, in the project agreement um, documents that are signed between Project Co and Metrolinx uh, and the province ultimately and um, during the implementation to make sure that we actually are getting um, the right uh, output, uh, if I could put it that way, um, for um, uh, transit, for the transit users in the city of Toronto. So we lead, um, our role is to lead the intergovernmental engagement. So transit expansion's role is to negotiate the agreements with um, the province. So we are um, and many of you, if you follow what's going on at council, uh, at city council, we've, um, there's been an agreement that what they call the preliminary agreement, which was the base document for the subway program. So that was something that we worked on, uh, very closely with multiple city divisions, um, and, uh, the province to, to get that approved. We've been working through go expansion, uh, agreements. So the master agreement that allows us to kind of work with Metrolinx, uh, effectively on, on the GO expansion program. And uh, we've just recently, uh, earlier this year, received, uh, received approval to amend 
um, the document that forms the basis for the Smart Track program. So this is the program that the mayor has um, identified as a key um, delivery for, for his term. So this is one of the things that we are working very closely with the province to, and Metrolinx in particular, to get these smart track stations uh, developed. So we're involved in uh, leading the, the discussions uh, with the province. Uh, of course, we don't do this by ourselves. We work very closely with other divisions, uh, but we're the, we're the sole kind of window. So the, we're the one point of contact in and the one point of contact out to the divisions and then vice versa. So that's uh, kind of the way that we would see ourselves. Um, we're also involved in coordination uh, of the decision-making on various transit initiatives. So we do engage very closely with a variety of different groups. Uh, obviously, as issues arise, um, we're involved in the issues management. And this is not just issues management during construction, but also the, um, the earlier stages in the planning, as well as into the, into the procurement, and then ultimately into the construction and closeout. So again, that full um, gamut of activities from the pre-planning stage right through to, to close out. Uh, we've also, and, and again, being a, a very new organization uh, division within the city of Toronto, we're beginning to actually um, solidify kind of process and project program structures. So this is very much about program management and how do we make sure that the right sets of, of tasks are being done, the right sets of processes are in place in order to facilitate decisions. So again, I wanna be very clear, I don't do anything unless council you know, effectively directs uh, us to actually do something. So we don't set policy, policy is set by the politicians, by council, we enact what, what council directs us to, to do. And, and then obviously we coordinate the, the various interests um, that the city has, the needs that the city have, and this is very important um, um, and, and Metrolinx is a good organization, as is IO, as is the province. They all have their own um, kind of benefits, but they also have their own blind spots. And they don't see a lot of times, and this is one of the risks that I see that I can share with you, is that sometimes they just don't see um, the same um, issues the way that the city would see those issues. So part of this is good people trying to work collaboratively to help each other understand what um, the issue is and more specifically what the need is in order to, to deliver transit that actually benefits the citizens of Toronto. So that's, that's in, in general kind of a, a grand uh, notion of, of what we do. Um, in, terms of, in terms of how we relate to the, to the TTC, because I know that this will obviously be a question um, that exists in many, in many people's minds. So the TTC is an agency of the city of Toronto. Um, we work closely with them and we coordinate with them um, as it relates to, to transit projects. Um, they are very much engaged on the subway program and they do so um, because ultimately they will be the operator of the transit system. So one of the key things that we are working with the province on uh, and the TTC is confirming that and confirming what that what the operational agreements will be. So that's part of the, the future agreements that come out. Um, so in order for them to be able to operate the system reliably, ensure that there's the appropriate availability and ultimately that the system can be maintained and operated properly, they need to be involved and engaged in the technical uh, development. And, and they do that and they do that well. And they have an expertise in, uh, in doing this to make sure that their systems work effectively. So we work very closely with the TTC um, in, that, in that function. So we provide the, the detail uh, related to the city's uh, needs. The TTC provides it very much more from a very TTC focus, but together what this does is it helps inform Metrolinx um, and uh, its agencies and ultimately the contractors that will be developing these projects on how they should actually uh, work uh, with the with the city. So uh, again, um, just to reemphasize, we're involved all the way through uh, from preconception to planning to procurement to implementation to closeout. Um, and to give you an idea of the size of the program that's currently 
that, that my division would be looking after. Uh, if you were to look at all the, the five pieces, and again, just to remind you again, it's rapid transit, smart track, um, the transit oriented communities, um, go expansion, as well as the subway program, you're looking at probably uh, in the amount of about $50 billion worth of transit initiatives. So transit expansion initiatives. So these are again, higher order transit uh, that you're, you're now, I'm sure, most everybody in the city is affected in one way or another by these transit projects, whether you're in the Northeast, Northwest, South, um, Central, you name it. Uh, I'm sure that at one point or another, um, you're involved um, or you've been impacted by these projects. So to give you an idea of some of the projects uh, very quickly that are currently underway, uh, the Eglinton Crosstown, basically most of you would know it, cuts across from Mount Dennis, uh, Black Creek Drive area, all the way over to Kennedy Road, 10 kilometers below grade, up to about uh, Laird. Then it pops out um, a bit, it goes back underneath at Don Mills, and then it goes surface all the way over to Kennedy Road. So that's the, the first of the, the major uh, DBFM, first of the major um, transit projects that existed uh, in Toronto. Finch West LRT from Keele all the way over to uh, Humber College. Uh, then there are probably about 40 um, projects that are in the GO expansion um, program. So this includes everything from enabling works, tracks, replacements, stations, um, some off corridor, or some on corridor works, um, and also includes uh, the work that's associated with the Encore uh, that many of you would probably know about. Uh, there is the the obviously the subway program that um, you're all aware of. So that's the Ontario line, uh, which goes from exhibition all the way up to the Science Center, um, the Shepherd, um, uh, sorry, the Scarborough subway extension, which goes from Kennedy up to McCowan with three stops. Uh, the Eglinton West LRT, the extension off to the west uh, from uh, Black Creek Drive from Mount Dennis over to Renforth. Uh, and then the Young North subway extension. So those are the four that form the subway program. And then there is the smart track program, which are the, the five stations that form um, the, the smart track program. Um, Finch, Kennedy, um, East Harbor station, King Liberty, um, Blue or Lansdowne um, are, the, are the five stations. So uh, generally those are the, are the programs. Um, so again, a lot of, a lot of very intense work. Um, I've got a great team of individuals uh, that works with me, uh, a great division, two directors who are responsible each for their own uh, segments, um, and then a whole slew of individuals who um, work with me um, to actually help uh, coordinate the delivery of transit. So again, we coordinate the delivery of transit links and the province uh, doing the delivery. So uh, I'll tell you kind of everything that I can, but if you're asking me about specifics on kind of where a particular piece of, uh, of track is and what's going on with it, I may not be able to answer it, but anyways, hopefully that gives you a bit of a context of, of what we do and how we do it. And I'm happy to be part of the city of Toronto and I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you. Um, the first question that I wanted to ask, um, when you were describing your expansion office, it sounded to me like there was a problem that the development of this office was intended to solve. Can, is, that, is that fair? And, and what were the communication issues before the establishment of your uh, office? So that's, uh, thank you for the question. I think that's a very good question. Um, when I, I was brought on board, the, the, the issue that existed was, and, and, and I can't speak to kind of all the, the history behind it, but a lot of what was happening was when a project was uh, introduced, say by Metrolinx, what would happen is Metrolinx would search out somebody from city planning, somebody from Toronto Water, somebody from Engineering Construction Services, somebody from Transportation Services. And what they'd be doing is they'd be going in and they'd be seeking information from all these different sources. Mm -hmm. So what was happening was 
kind of a, a Tower of Babel, if I can use that kind of example, everybody speaking to them in their own language, trying to get their own points across. And sometimes, at least from what I understood, that wasn't happening uh, effectively. And what you would get is a bit of frustration, not a bit, quite a bit, a <laughs> frustration on, well, obviously you're not listening, you know, this is transit, you know, say Metrolinks or the, the contractors, you're not listening to what we have to say. We have to build this. We need you to approve things faster. We need you to approve, um, you know, different ways of doing things. And, and we're not getting that, that traction from you. So um, part of this, pro the part of the problem that they were trying to solve is creating this office that would be able to interact with Metrolinks, understand their language, so to speak, and translate it to the city divisions and vice versa. So that what happened was um, you're able to make sure that at least it's not that every problem gets solved easily and never does, mm -hmm. but at least the communication then is you're speaking the same kind of language. I would almost kind of call us a Rosetta Stone, but I, I don't want to do that, <laughs> but kind of. So you have relationships now with each of those divisions that you just mentioned, whether it's Toronto, uh, Water, the TTC, City Planning. You, you get reports from them regularly, or, or how does the communication between you and those divisions work? So we we actually engage with them on a regular basis, like through through a series of meetings uh, on a particular project. Um, so we would be first of all, there is what we there's a governance structure. Um, that exists that we've established with Metrolinks that allows us to create the working tables that allow for that interaction to occur at, at a certain level. We then have our own internal mechanisms that allow these, these internal working tables that allow us to sit down with our, our colleagues in the other city divisions and the TTC to actually work through um, some of the issues um, that that exists so that when we do sit down with our external partners that we're doing so with uh, a general consensus. I, I would never say that we're always 100% aligned, but generally we are agreeing on on a certain approach, if, if I could if I could say that. So that's kind of how we do it. Um, a lot of discussion, a lot of interaction with our various city colleagues to make sure that we are um, presenting the, the information to, to our external partners. Okay, great. Okay, I have a question and I don't wanna get you into trouble, but you use the word blind spots. So I just wanted to probe a little bit and ask you, can you give an example of the kind of blind spots that, um, that you were referring to and perhaps how your office has worked to help Metrolinx and other agencies see things from the city's perspective? Is that a fair question? Um, sure, I'll, I'll try to explain it um, perhaps this way. So let me let me give you an example in in terms of land. Uh, so land acquisition is, as you can imagine, um, when you're developing a subway system in the middle of an urban, like a major urban center, um, and you need to take land, and it doesn't matter whether it's city land or it's private land, um, you can imagine the reaction of people when. Um, you're, you're not um, communicating to them that this land needs to be taken. Mm -hmm. So one of the areas that was a, a concern was, and, and this is not uh, um, a knock on, on Metrolinks per se, but um, when you're the province, there's a different view on, on you taking land. You can, as an example, use expropriation and kind of issue your notice of expropriation and you can you know, go through the process and you can expropriate the land, right? That's mm -hmm. what you could do. Well, the city um, has a lot of interaction with communities and these communities are, are concerned about land being taken and land being taken unnecessarily. Um, and what I mean by that is that you may not need large parcels of land when in fact you really need it only as slivers. And some of that um, discussion needed to, to be had with Metrolinks to help them understand that there are different ways to pursue um, taking land that's necessary, and it is necessary to build. Um, and and we need, that space needs to be there in order to facilitate the construction. Right. But there may be different ways to do it. So rather than um, um, you know, an outright purchase as an example, um, you could go to kind of you know, easements or licenses or different different forms, right? So 
Uh, in that case, we work very closely with our corporate real estate who are experts at uh, dealing with land issues. And they work with us and with Metrolinks to help inform them as to, as to some of the, uh, the issues that, that go on. Um, so examples that... on Edlington Crosstown is an example. Okay, let's um, talk about that. Same, same, same thing. And, and Metrolinks has been, um, um, you know, I, I would say good at, at working with us on it, but the communication still isn't fully there is, to give you an example, there's a lot of work that has to occur. There's a lot of equipment, um, construction, lay down areas that can only occur in the middle of the road. And what that's doing is it's blocking uh, access to, to businesses. And you can imagine with COVID um, that, that plus the fact that businesses, it's difficult for, for people to access it, uh, businesses are suffering. So um, Metrolinks realized this. It's not that they didn't, um, but part of this is how do we communicate this better to uh, councillors, to uh, communities that this work needs to go on and how do they realize that perhaps as time moves on that they really do need to pull back on some of these down areas and begin to open up the streets. It's not to say that they're opening up the, the subway or the LRT as an example, but how do they begin to shrink down their footprint um, and begin to kind of open up? And that's and that's part of that discussion that we have with Metrolinks and, and they're receptive to it, um, but it's it's a difficult kind of place to to go for people who like we, we you know, we need to do construction and we need to build. Mm -hmm. So we just need to get on the stuff, right? So that's kind of uh, a couple of examples. Right. Well, it must be difficult because my understanding is that the city of Toronto, in terms of its authority, is uh, is granted by the province. And so while you wish to advocate for, let's say, Toronto residents or Toronto councillors, uh, what powers uh, does your office or does Toronto have when, let's say, there's a disgruntled uh, Toronto resident uh, whose land is being appropriated or uh, businesses whose uh, business is being uh, impeded by construction activities? Do we have any leverage vis-a-vis -vis the province? Is that a fair question or is it getting into areas outside of your um, uh, legal uh, knowledge. <laughs> uh, I, I, would, I would say, from a legal perspective, I would say, yeah, I, I don't 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 know from a legal perspective. However, uh, you ask what leverage do we have? Um, the reality is that in order for Metrolinks as um, the, the principal agent uh, for the province to develop a subway, do go expansion, do rapid transit in the city of Toronto. Um, they do need to connect into city services. They do need to engage, they do need to get permits. Um, they do need to uh, yeah. ensure that um, if there's a road closure that um, they can facilitate that. So it does them no good to, to turn around and be arbitrary about it, um, about them having that authority. So they work very closely with us. Um, and, and look, I'm not gonna mince words, it's, it's never, 100% that we can go in there and have them change their ways. Mm -hmm. But they have been, um, you know, when it comes time to, to, to deal with certain issues, they have been reasonable at times to, to actually listen to kind of what we need to say. But you're right. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, they could turn around and they could ignore us if they chose to. They're the <laughs> province. Well, let's hope that doesn't, hopefully you're persuasive enough that won't happen. So I have a question. I, I noticed that a few months ago there was a, a, a bit of a, concern about the RFPs that went out for the Ontario line. And it appeared that uh, the TTC was going to be losing uh, operation uh, control, uh, operating uh, the, the control of operations over that line. And you were quoted as saying that you were going to, to work it out with the with, with Metrolinx and that negotiations were ongoing. So I wanted to ask how, how did that shake out in the end? So, so that's still a work in progress. Um, but, the, but, but the principal message um, that I would like to give to everybody is that it was always contemplated um, as part of the preliminary agreement that the operations um, and, and not, and I want to be careful on people have a uh, different views on operations, but the, the folks that would be um, uh, operating the, the, the vehicles, um, the front facing 
on staff is um, going to be the TTC because it is connecting into um, the, the TTC system. So um, there is a discussion about kind of what the various roles are between uh, province and city slash TTC on, on these projects. And that's still a work in progress. It's, it's one of the agreements that um, we're gonna be working on uh, probably over the next uh, year or so uh, to get to get resolved. Okay. So it's it's a work in progress, as much as I can tell you right now. Okay. Yeah, I have a question about this expropriation uh, business that you mentioned. Um, some people are discussing on the chat about um, the Dundas West subway station hooking into the Bloor uh, Go station, and. It's my understanding that expropriation would perhaps uh, um, achieve a, a major transit hub uh, in that area. Do, does your office have a role to play there? I think a lot of people are frustrated that it hasn't happened. Yeah, so so um, I think what you're referring to is there is um, one of the Smart Track program. Uh, part of the Smart Track program is Bluer Lansdowne Station. The Bluer Lansdowne Station. Uh, does have a connection into um, into the um, into the line two, and I'm not sure if that's maybe what you're referring to. I'm thinking one stop west of that. There's the Dundas West subway station, which there's a lot of streetcars there, and adjacent to the Dundas West subway station is the Bloor Go station, which connects to the up train that goes north, and there is a very the, the two tracks almost intersect. But there's a, a private building, which is a, oh. a large apartment, the Crossways, where I think yes. it's a small amount of underground parking that would need to be, for some reason, there hasn't been the necessary expropriation. So some people are chatting on the chat uh, here about why, why hasn't that land been appropriated uh, to facilitate this? And maybe, yeah. you know, I know that you're not the builder, you're not, you're not the, the deliverer of transit, but maybe you have some insights. Maybe I know our counselors have, have mentioned this issue before with some frustration. Yeah, so, so now, now I'm, my apologies, now I, now I remember which one you're, when you're, which one you're talking about. Um, so um, there are discussions that are, are occurring between uh, corporate real estate and um, Metrolinx, and I, I would believe the TTC on this as well. Um, so um, I, I really can't, uh, first of all, I don't have all the information. And mm -hmm. secondly, I'm not, I'm not really at liberty to kind of you know, provide that information. Like no, of course, of course. Okay, so let's talk about COVID-19. Um, I understand that that has really impacted drastically reduced transit use. Um, uh, how uh, has that been changing in recent months and, and what role, if any, does your office have in dealing with that? So uh, I think the impact of, of COVID-19 on, on transit um, delivery, I mean, would probably be a question better uh, asked of the TTC because I know that they've they've experienced um, a significant um, uh, reduction in their services. But let me give you an example of maybe bringing it back to how it impacts uh, delivery of transit within transit expansion within the city of Toronto. So um, there has been on the Eglinton Crosstown, as many of you are aware, um, it's a project that should have been completed. Um, I think you know, basically end of this year, it's going to be delayed. Um, part of that delay is due to uh, the impacts of COVID. So, I mean, obviously there are other kind of factors, but one of the main uh, issues was that uh, during uh, much of last year, um, uh, the contractor, uh, CTS, was experiencing difficulty, you know, having, getting people to work on the sites. Some of the sites had to be closed down because they were, having cases of COVID on there. So um, while people may think, hey, construction was still going on on, on Eglinton Crosstown, and it was. I mean, they're still working pretty much 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, there was a significant impact even to uh, areas where people thought, ah, well, it's construction and they're just keep going. No, um, it impacted even the delivery of construction projects. And, and I'm sure that um, whether it was on, on Eglinton or on Finch or on some of the other programs, uh, projects, they've experienced um, certain impacts uh, as it relates to, to, to COVID and, and the ability to get resources uh, working on their projects. 
Wow. Okay. All right. So let me ask you, I'm, I'm trying to understand to what extent you can have an impact advocating for Toronto rev residents. And I, I noticed there was another article about uh, the Don Valley and a GO train facility that was going to uh, um, interfere with some uh, ecologically significant lands there. And you were quoted as saying that you were having discussions with Metrolinx and the TRCA to balance the competing land use interests in the ravine and that you have success, successfully negotiated solutions that avoided impacts to the most sensitive areas in the Lower Don Valley. So I just wanted to ask you a bit more about that. Does that mean that there are some parts of the Lower Don Valley that are that the TRCA considered to be less sensitive? How, how did that kind of negotiation work? What, what does that look like? So, so um, first of all, let me let me give you um, some some context behind the um, the Lower Dawn area that we're talking about. The area that we were uh, initially talking about was, I believe, uh, about and I'm and I'm please don't quote me on the exact acreage, but it was around let's say about six acres or thereabouts that Metrolinx owned. It was their right of way. It was their land. It was. It was in their within their rights to um, to actually um, use this facility. In fact, it was it's track. There's track there, and it was actually I think at some time it was uh, it was actually used as a layby facility at some point. So the initial the initial layout for the the lo the uh, layover um, contemplated multiple tracks. It, con it contemplated a much larger footprint uh, mm -hmm. in the valley. And through the work of um, the, my team, my division, so Shalyn uh, Laboa, who's my director, um, she, um, you know, carefully with TRCA's involvement, with involvement of our urban parks and uh, parks and forestry and uh, recreation folks, um, as well as other folks, um, sat down with Metrolinx, explained to them about the sensitivity. I mean, they realized this, right? They understood that there's a sensitivity. Um, and what they were able to do was there was concerns with regards to sensitive areas located near where they were proposing to put this lay down facility. So they, um, as well as potential issues with regards to flooding and how that would impact um, these sensitive areas. So what happened was through a lot of good negotiation um, and, and our transit um, uh, planning folks were involved in it as well. What they were able to do was to shrink down the footprint of this area to now it's I think about two acres give or take and to move it further up and, and away from these more sensitive areas it is still in the Don Valley area it is still sorry in the in this in this area um, is it is it um, it's it's to say that it's not in a sensitive area is, is kind of like anywhere in the Don Valley, I think is a sensitive area. Um, well, you said the most sensitive area. So that's the, the idea was the idea was that through discussions with us, and this is part of the advocate advocation that we do, we were able to have that discussion with Metrolinx. They came to the realization, they moved it, they shifted it, and now it's in less in in, in an area that is still within their property. And they are going to work with us to, and, and this is the, the ongoing, they're gonna work with us to you know, put up appropriate screening and uh, you know, try to integrate as much as they can um, you know, what is you know, effectively an ugly uh, train uh, lay-by area in, into the valley. So, so it's not like people are gonna see these trains idling and spewing out um, diesel. These things are gonna be parked they're going to be connected up to electricity so that they can keep themselves charged mm -hmm. and it'll be screened. Uh, and that's some of the, the work that we're going to be working on uh, with Metrolinx on is they'll be screened so that it's, it's you know, keeps that area uh, an area for the residents of Toronto. Okay, it, that's great. generally kind of what's going on. So how did the issue, that conservationist uh, concern, how did that issue land on your desk? Where did it come from? Through, through the good work that um, many of the um, individuals, um, community groups, um, um, folks such as yourselves, as an example, would, would, bring, these, uh, would bring these items up to councillors, uh, would bring it up to Metrolinx, would bring it up to us, as an example, 
um, through the mayor's office uh, or to us directly. I, I can't remember exactly where this one came from, but the reality was through that, um, that community engagement um, that, uh, that goes on, uh, we get this information mm -hmm. and, and we work on it. We work on it with the counselors. Um, sometimes they may not agree with everything that we have to tell them, but um, we do uh, work with them when, you know, items of concern are raised by communities. And then what we do is we go back to Metrolinks. And again, that's that one window from us to Metrolinks to say, and by the way, Metrolinks, you have now created this um, issue um, do you realize the impact it's having on the community? Have you consulted with the community? Have you consulted with the counselors? Do you understand the, the, what you are doing and why it's so critical to us? And by the way, here's our principles mm -hmm. that we would like to see uh, you uh, consider when you're, when you're doing this design. Okay. And a lot of times what will happen is they'll be like, oh yeah, okay. And again, I'm not living in this panacea world. They would do everything that we say but at least they do listen to us. Cause then again, that governance that I was talking about before, we have ability to, to escalate through various levels to ensure that we're, we're getting the, at least our voices heard more effectively um, from, the various, from the various levels at Metrolinx and the province. Okay, I'm gonna push you a little bit more on your answer. Uh, sure. You said here are our principles and I'm trying to figure out who sets your priorities. Is it the mayor? Is it a, a subcommittee at council? Um, is there a bit of legislation that created your office that sort of uh, helps you decide what your priorities are for your office? Um, or, or are you self-directed um, in, in the way that you were uh, mandated to operate? So I'll, I'll try to answer this and hopefully it answers your question. Um, as I said before, we don't set policy. Policy is set by, by the politicians. They make, they make decisions uh, based on advice that we may provide to them. Um, they can choose to tell us to go in a certain direction. Uh, we will do that. Um, they provide that direction, obviously, through the city manager um, and then to my uh, deputy city manager, which is Tracy Cook. And then ultimately to, to me on um, kind of our direction that we need to take. So whether it's on subways or on smart track, um, again, these are, these are things that we work um, through council um, at council's authority. Um, so they, they provide the direction, the direction to us. So all of council and not a specific subcommittee. Yeah, that's, that's correct. That's okay. correct. It's, 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 you know, obviously there are, I'm sure that there are different, there are different committees and different working groups that go on, but we receive uh, whatever direction that we receive, we receive it, you know, at, at the will of, of council, if I can put it to you that way. Um, in terms of how we engage with Metrolinks, that's something that we take on uh, ourselves. Again, we, you know, our job, quite honestly, is to, is to advocate to make sure that our, the needs of the citizens of Toronto are being met from a transit perspective. And um, like that's something that we take on and that's part of what my division does mm -hmm. is to go out there and push and prod on province, on Metrolinks, on the, on the, uh, the external partners that we have to make sure that they're actually doing what they're doing. So okay. and part of it is us directing ourselves on stuff that we actually should be doing on behalf of the city. And part of it is that the fact is that this, the, the, the policy directs us as to what, where we should be going. Okay. Um, we have a few minutes left. If I could remind everyone to please mute yourselves if you're not speaking. And you can also ask questions in the chat. Um, I am checking it from time to time. I have uh, one more follow up question for you right now, though, before I let you go to the uh, other people in the chat. You use the word escalate. So that was interesting. It summoned an image to my mind that there's someone that you're mostly dealing with at Metrolinks, and if there's issues, it might escalate within Metrolinks. Is that what you meant? And are you allowed to um, uh, tell us, uh, you know, which offices you're dealing with and what the escalation process might look like? So, so sure, sure. So um, one of the first things um, that we established very early on with Metrolinks and the province is a governance structure, um, because um, while it may have existed in certain forms. It, it wasn't clearly uh, focused on transit, uh, on the transit expansion. So 
what we've done is we've worked closely with the province, with Metrolinx, with IO, with Infrastructure Ontario, to establish um, various uh, kind of tiers of, of structure, govern, uh, governance structure, let's call it that, um, where there are uh, working level um, kind of functions. So to give you an example, in my division, um, I've got project managers, senior project managers, coordinators, whose job it is to work with their colleagues at Metrolinx, primarily in their sponsorship office, um, if it's in the planning stage, uh, if it's an implementation, it's in their capital program projects, projects group, program group, stay um, uh, group, and they work through the various issues. Uh, the next step up in the governance structure is what they call steering committees. And these steering committees are exactly what they're intended to do is they, there's items that get escalated up to that steering committee. Their idea is to steer and to guide uh, the working groups to actually facilitate um, the right design, the right solution, the right resolution to a particular issue. If that um, fails, um, and I don't want to call it fails, if that's not successful, then there is a program group uh, where I sit with, uh, where I sit on, and that's um, the group that's um, the more senior group in, again, comprised of senior individuals from the various groups at Metrolinx, Province, IO, um, to hear kind of the various issues that may come up, have that discussion, and then direct the steering group um, to go back and to um, consider, um, you know, different options, review it, um, you know, provide them the, 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 the direction. If it needs to escalate further, um, and it's not necessarily an escalation, it could just simply even be um, just more, more for update, but there is a more senior group, which is the Transit Executive Committee. And that's comprised of um, Phil Verster from uh, Metrolinx, um, Chris Murray, the city manager, uh, Rick, Rick Leary from TTC, um, and um, other kind of key individuals who, I mean, he, they could hear the, the escalation issues, but a lot of times what happens by the time it gets up to there, most of these issues have already been dealt with at, at program group. But, but there is a, a structure where it can go up to where there's discussion that can occur at that level. And at that level, it's, you know, again, senior individuals who are involved in it. So the idea is a cascade of, of, of uh, dealing with uh, particular issues uh, that may arise on the project. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, okay, I, I haven't gotten another question on the chat, but I'm going to ask one that I had in the can that I was thinking about. Sure, sure. Um, you mentioned this expropriation and having to help, um, uh, you know, basically liaise uh, between uh, stakeholders. So the concerns of residents when they're dealing with an expropriation um, and Metrolinx wanting to expropriate. And I believe that I read in the newspaper the other day that there was a landowner near Kiel and Dundas that was going to have its uh, his land or its land uh, expropriated by Metrolinx. And the amount that he was going to get was zero dollars or something very close to zero because it was allegedly contaminated land. Does this sound familiar? And, and if it does, um, and even if it doesn't, what kind of a role would your office uh, be playing in dealing with that? And, you know, it kind of comes back to my question about leverage, because if Metrolinx has made a determination to um, uh, uh, to uh, appropriate land and uh, there's going to be a takings and you've got councillors who have a lot of political pressure from their constituents to deal with things in a more fair way. Um, uh, does your office have a, a way of smoothing things or negotiating or um, uh, helping um, bring peace to the various stakeholders when it comes to an issue like that? Um, so so uh, I'm not sure of the, of the, the details regarding this one, uh, this particular issue, because uh, as you can imagine, there's, there's yep. quite, a bit, quite a lot of discussion that goes on. Um, so to answer your question, uh, yes. Um, so we would we would work very closely with our corporate real estate um, group, so the corporate real estate management group, to sit down with Metrolinx and to actually work through a, a reasonable or at least get an understanding of what they're why they're approaching it uh, this way. Uh, we would, um, you know, after that, obviously have discussions with the local councillor. 
um, to to kind of make sure that they were aware of uh, of what um, the particular issue was, so that if the constituent were to to go to the counselor, that they would be informed. Uh, we I don't know that we would get uh, like we don't. I, I know that my division doesn't get directly involved with uh, a particular landowner to deal with uh, a particular issue with Metro Links. Um, but again, the, the the leverage portion is for us to go back to Metro Links and actually ask the question, why are you doing this? What is it that you need? Um, you know, provide the detail that helps support, you know, your rationale so that we can have a meaningful discussion with um, so that corporate real estate, quite honestly, can have a, a you know a full understanding of what's going on. But we can also then have a discussion with counselors to make sure that they're aware of uh, of what the particular issue is. So this one here, I, I don't know why they would have taken that position. Um, um, I'm sorry, I just I just don't have all the detail on that one. That's okay. No, I shouldn't. It's a little bit unfair. It came out of okay. uh, just my own uh, readings of the of the news. Um, so I see that we have a couple of uh, questions, but it looks like there are answers. Um, okay. So if anyone else has any questions, I'm finding it hard to read too much on the chat all at once and also uh, speak. So if anyone does have any questions, please put them out there. I think we have about eight minutes left. If there's anyone who has um, uh, to ask anything. And I do see that there is one, which was just um, about the governance structure that you were speaking about earlier. Is there is that listed on your website somewhere or is that public? Um, that's a, that's a good question. I, it's not, it's not on our website. It's not on our website um, per se. And it's not that we don't want to share it. I'm, I'm just, I'm just kind of, um, I, to tell you the honest truth, I don't. We we haven't shown it on there, because um, I, I I guess um, we've never really thought to actually share uh, the governance structure. And and quite honestly, it's it's a relationship uh, between ourselves and MetroLinks and the province. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not like it's some sort of a secret kind of thing. It's actually practical pro program management to have um, you know tables that will allow for appropriate escalation of issues so that they don't get bogged down. So it's not something kind of super exciting. I hate to say it. It's it's just what we do from a program management perspective. Okay. So I do have another question from Jim Gao, and I think this might have to do with your comment about blind spots because this sounds familiar to me. He says, Jim says, there are a number of areas with high density development happening example, six points, where more community transit could play a role, given that some development is occurring outside easy walking distance to subway station. Does your office participate in creating synergies between land use and transit service in such areas? So, so um, I don't know about the six point um, in particular, but let me give you uh, uh, an answer um, that I hopefully will, will help you understand or the uh, folks on the line understand. So we work, we're working with um, the, the province um, and Metrolinks and Infrastructure Ontario on what we're calling transit oriented communities. And what this is, is um, a couple of things. Um, um, it's either um, Metrolinks has uh, land, uh, has a mass land around uh, a station, uh, or there is land uh, in the vicinity of a station where a developer may choose to go to Metrolinks um, and say, Metrolinks, uh, we'd like to, you know, with our pieces of land, with your, you know, station land, you know, area, your area over your right away, over beside, um, you know, where a station would go. Uh, we would like to develop it further. So there's opportunities for for developers to work with Metrolinks to um, propose these these um, locations where uh, these opportunities occur near near obviously near um, transit stations near their go stations primarily, um, and there'd be some obviously some benefit that would return back to um, you know the city and or um, you know, Metrolinks in the process of, of this, um, this massing of land and, and 
kind of the development that could potentially occur in and around the stations. Mm -hmm. um, it's guided by our planning process. So it still requires um, that a developer needs to go through the appropriate city planning in order to do this, but there is that opportunity to do it. That's one version of this transit-oriented communities. Another version is, and primarily say around our uh, the, the new subway stations is, can there be uh, massing of land um, to develop interest in potentially uh, developments uh, in and around uh, stations? Um, so is there different ways that land parcels can be assembled to actually, again, facilitate more intensification in and around and above uh, stations? And again, part of this is to deal with, you know, city, you know, good city planning. How, how do you intensify um, effectively? And part of it is that obviously in doing this, um, there's potentials that, you know, it could defray some of the costs of, you know, the capital build of some of these stations as an example. So there are opportunities for that to occur. And a lot of times this is developed, first of all, it's, it's led by Metrolinx and the province and Infrastructure Ontario because it's related to their to their programs, um, but they are very receptive to developers uh, reaching out to them in certain locations in and around their their assets to to see if there's opportunities. So if somebody is interested in doing that, they should reach out to um, to to Metrolinx, um, and they will, I'm sure, if nothing else, at least have a discussion with you. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, so here's what I'm going to propose that we do. Um, we're up at the one hour mark now, and I promised Brian that we would go exactly to one hour. So we will officially say that we're done, but after um, we allow people, give people leave to go, we I'm, I'm okay to keep this line open for a few more minutes if people want to turn sure. on their videos on and chat. Is that okay with you? Yeah, absolutely. Happy okay, great. Do it. So then let's formally conclude in this way. I'll say thank you very much. This has been uh, Derek Toygo, who's been speaking to us about the Toronto Expansion Office and, uh, and its role with uh, um, uh, helping us to get our transit uh, projects built in, in the Toronto area. Um, thank you so much. I did learn a lot. Um, and I also wanted to just remind everyone um, that we could really use uh, more members. Uh, it would be wonderful if you would join us at the Transit Alliance. We're a not-for-profit uh, not organization, and, uh, and we can no longer host those lovely dinners, so we miss you very much and would like to do that again soon. So please do consider joining uh, the membership. And with that, um, we will conclude the meeting and thank you, you're free to go. And if anyone wants to turn on their cameras and chat for a little bit, I'm gonna stay for a bit and uh, Derek Toygo will also be here for a few more minutes. Um, I know there were some more questions on the chat that people weren't able to ask. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. There's Pierre, hi, Pierre. Let's see who else is coming on. Oh, I think uh, Pierre is going to be asking you about the uh, Ontario line a little bit more. Sure. Do you want me to ask your question, Pierre? Oh, he's frozen. I notice Albert is here, Albert Cole. Nice to see you. Um, Albert is a bicycling advocate, um, really instrumental in getting the Bloor bike lanes put in. Um, do you have any role with bikes, bike, lane, bike lanes? Um, no, I think I think that's more our transportation services folks. So that's Barbara Gray and, and, uh, and her group. But yeah. I mean, obviously as part of um, many of the subway program, uh, subway stations, uh, smart track stations, there is, a significant uh, bis bicycle um, uh, impact. So in other words, getting to the station, you know, that, that first mile, last mile kind of discussion about how do you get to a station and is there the right infrastructure in place to ensure that, you know, if somebody chooses to ride their bike to a station that, you know, for example, that there's, you know, bike storage um, there, that it's, you know, it's secure, um, it's easy to access. So. So that's our, our, our role. And, and by the way, Metrolinx is, you know, keen on that as well. So um, we, we work closely to make sure that, that the, you know, if questions like that come up, that there are. Okay, you know, great. And I see but it's, John it's primarily transportation services that deals with the, with the bike lanes. 
Okay, I see Jonathan Giggs has his hand up. Do you have a question, Jonathan? Yes, thank you. Um, I was wondering, um, in the film, Mr. Jane and Finch, uh, the Guyanese Canadian activist, Winston LaRose, he was sort of like leading opposition to the Finch LRT coming through that community of Jane and Finch because they really feared that the transit was going to be um, detrimental to their community, that, that the area would become uh, gentrified, uh, housing prices would raise, and a lot of people would be displaced. And I was also thinking about what was happening with the cross town, where the effects that it's had, for instance, on the little Jamaica neighborhood uh, along Eglinton between Keel and, say, uh, the Allen Road. I'm just wondering what sort of comments you have. Uh, how could transit uh, authorities or planning agencies, when we're constructing these things, how could they be a little bit more successful in protecting these people and not, um, you know, making making that there are certain losers. Uh, as a result of, uh, of you know, transit progress. Um, that's a that's a that's an interesting that's an interesting question. Um, in terms of in terms of uh, whether transit would cause um, gentrification or houses prices to rise and, and whatnot, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how I could could answer that. Uh, I mean, effectively, I, I think. Uh, if you build it um, and, and people see that there's a benefit and as a result of that, um, house prices rise, I, I think that may be, may be, it may be an unintended consequence to some, but to, to others, it may actually be uh, a benefit. In terms of how, it, how we're dealing with impacts to businesses such as in Little Jamaica, which is one of the areas that we're concerned about, um, what we've done is, so Metrolinx does have uh, language in their in their documents on Eglinton Crosstown, that actually gives um, 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 business owners an ability to to seek um, you know compensation for impacts as a result of the transit. One of the things that we're working closely with Metrolinx on in future projects is ensuring that there's language that's clear um, that gives people an understanding of you know more upfront when things are going to happen what kind of impact it will be for how long. And if it does impact, how can you go through the process of actually um, seeking redress um, from, from Metrolink? So this is not a guarantee that everybody will be compensated, but one of the things that we did learn was that perhaps there needs to be clarity in how they can go about doing that. Um, because many of these businesses are small businesses. They're not, they're not, kind of savvy um, individuals. So they'll want to know that they can get, um, you know, access to the right person in the right time and be treated and to be, be treated fairly. So one of the things that, that we are embedding into our future uh, contract is more deep, more specifics on, you need to be clear Metrolinx province on how you're going to help um, these folks if they are impacted by construction as it goes on. But don't you don't you think that maybe that the compensation has to be sort of like included in the project and has to be much on a much larger scope than you so far you've contemplated? I think in Minneapolis maybe they relocated businesses, but if you're on Crosstown on Eglinton and you've got hoarding in front of your shop and you know the construction is supposed to be finished in one year and three years later it's still going on and your clients can't get there somehow you know it's almost like you should be you've almost expropriated their businesses for a number of years and you haven't really provided any sort of compensation. And it seems to me like a kind of a cumbersome way to go through um, to get maybe which to them, maybe to Metrolinx is a small amount of money, but to these people, it's their, it's their, it's their yeah. livelihood. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, I think, I think, you know, you, you've raised a good point and, and um, one of the things, and, and, and obviously this is a discussion that really is, uh, needs to be had with with Metrolinx and with the province on how to deal with this better. And you're right, there are examples. It, New York um, had a had a plan in place to to deal with um, how um, transit impact um, how transit impacts um, uh, businesses. Um, there's been other municipalities that have the same thing. Um, I, I do think that there needs to be some discussion, further discussion about it. And I guess this is part of that ongoing um, while we thought 
that by putting in lane rental charges and and other kind of mechanisms that existed in the Eglinton Crosstown uh, would have actually dissuaded and would have kept the amount of time um, uh, to a minimum. Um, maybe that's not the only answer to this. So this is all to say that there needs to be further discussion, obviously, on how can how can we better address uh, these concerns. Um, and and by the way, the councillors have, you know, indicated that that's something that's very keen. They they're very keen to get more information on. So again, as Ontario Line goes out and as the other projects go out, we are going to be looking at um, more. At least, if nothing else, print first set clarity um, on kind of what they can do, and then the next steps is what other measures can we take. Okay. Thank, thank you very much for your response, and thank you for allowing me to ask the question, Saba. Thank you. Oh, no problem. I I was going to say let's uh, let's let's call it, but I see there's one more question from someone named MacBook Air. I'm not sure what your name is. Michael Kershank. <laughs> Bit of a corollary on the last question. It's not just the disruption, but it's the uncertain timeline and Eglinton has obviously gone a little bit uh, past its due date. What are the odds that uh, the Ontario line is going to be finished by 19, uh, 2030 as uh, I guess that was the second date that was put out? So, so um, look, I'm not going to speak, I'm not going to speak for the province and for Metrolinx, um, but um, construction of linear infrastructure, as you may well be aware, is um, way more intensive than, than vertical infrastructure. Um, can we ever guarantee a, a date? Um, I would say no, but based on the scheduling that we've seen to date, which again, it's high level, um, they there's a good indication that it will um you know that they are targeting to get to that 2030 uh date because in fact they have already issued um the uh, the rfps so the request for proposals for at least the southern segment and the northern segment will be going out uh, i think q2 q3 of this year so there's very much a push to maintain the dates uh, that they've uh, that they've put forward, but I, I can't predict. There's like, but as you said, as Eglinton has experienced all sorts of issues, um, there could be other issues on Ontario Line that that I don't, I, I can't foresee right now. But twenty thirty sounds. I don't, I don't hear a bet. Day. Okay, thank you, um, Bell Denning. I think you had a question. Yes. Um, just, I don't know um, if you heard in the, uh, the steering committees, the technical committees, the discussions that happen in, or in and around your office, much discussion about uh, what I would call post-project evaluation. So when we're through all of this, each project gets done, it comes online, people ride the system. Um, I'm familiar with uh, the World Bank's process where there is always a thing called the implementation completion report. And it's a little awkward because it just the project itself, in a sense, never ends. It goes on and keeps operating. But the implementation of the project is what we would call construction and opening to use. Um, have people given much thought to how we would learn from the practices that we've put in place and, and improve them? Yes, actually, um, one of the key um, um, processes that we're putting in place in transit expansion is to do actually that. When uh, we get closer to completion of both Eglinton and Finch and some of the other projects, we do go through um, a lessons learned um, process, a knowledge transfer process. And we are working uh, right now actually with Metrolinx on uh, these projects to actually um, get into the details. So exactly some of the questions that were raised about how do we deal with business impacts? How do we deal with uh, lane closures? How do we deal with and how do we modify change uh, what's going on so that the next projects learn from these other ones? So it is very much something that we are um, that we are actively uh, working on with Metrolinx. Uh, again, just remember that they are their projects, but they do understand the impact that it has on the city and they're willing to, to work with us on that. What will come out of that 
um, in terms of a report per se. I, I mean, I'm not quite sure. Although, um, like you, I've heard about these reports. Um, what we want to do is actually get something that's more um, that can be implemented. Because I worry that you create a report, uh, it's a nice document, then it gets put on a shelf. So what we want to do is get the re get the the actual integrate actions identified, and then quickly implement them into into our projects. Because as you said, there's like a constant movement on these projects. So so yeah, I think yes, to answer your question, that is something that we are definitely considering and we're working on very closely with Metrolink Sun. Okay, thank you so much. All right, I'm going to let you guys go. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, I really enjoyed uh, even the, uh, especially actually, I'd say the the, the post discussion discussion. <laughs> great. Thank you okay. very much for asking the questions. Have a great day. You okay. too. Goodbye, everyone.